our way. Walk live. Here we go. Welcome everybody to This Is Not A Drill. My name is Melina Abdullah. We are going to jump right into it today. Everyone knows that This Is Not A Drill is Black Lives Matter Los Angeles political education platform. So every Thursday night we engage around really important political questions. Last week, our own Baba Akili was on with Dolores Huerta talking about the importance of May Day and the labor movement. Tonight, though, is a special People's Budget LA edition of This Is Not a Drill. We're going to be engaging with our city council members around the people's budget, around the budget issues, around what has been proposed and what the people would like to see passed. And so we're really appreciative. This is the second year that we've engaged with the Los Angeles City Council. Last year, we were in chambers. This year, because of COVID-19, we're doing it virtually. But we see on with us several of our council members, and we partnered with City Council President Nuri Martinez to make sure that we could have this conversation. Many of our comrades are on tonight. Many folks from Black Lives Matter Los Angeles will be presenting along with members of the People's Budget LA Coalition. And so thank you, Council President Martinez, for working with us, um, for making sure that the People's Budget was part of the considerations as City Council grapples with what a budget should look like for the City of Los Angeles this year. Welcome to This Is Not a Drill. Thank you, Malina. Can everyone hear me? Great. Thank you so much for having me this evening. It's good to be here. I'm Nuri Martinez, the president of the Los Angeles City Council. I just want to thank again, Melina, for working with us. I think you and I had talked about at the beginning of the year of having a formal presentation to a few members of the City Council, and you and I had conversations about what that would look like. So I'm glad it's actually come to fruition. And thank you for being part of the South, South, South LA budget listening session. I think it was very productive. We had a number of folks participating for the duration of that listening session. I think you did a terrific job. So thank you. Uh, those of you who don't know me aren't familiar with who I am. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. I actually grew up in Pocoima. I'm the daughter of immigrants. My parents immigrated to this country from the state of Zacatecas. Uh, my first language was Spanish. I'm an English learner. Uh, my first language was Spanish. And so I grew up in a you know, in a, you know, in a poor, poor, to a poor family. I mean, my father was a dishwasher when I was growing up and he did that for almost 25 years uh, until he was able to get a manufacturing job. And my mom was a factory worker who got a job right across the street from my, from where I grew up. I went out to the neighborhood schools and I always knew that giving back was important. I was a young activist fighting for environmental justice when I was in high school, just because I saw the severity of the stuff that I was growing up. Um, or that things that were happening around my community and the pollution that was taking place and the dumping that was going on day in and day out. And we felt as a community, we need to push back um, on some of our community leaders and making sure that we were represented. But on the city council, it's given me, a, 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 it's been the honor of my life to not only serve the community that I grew up in, but that I get to actually lead on some of these really important conversations to bring equity to a lot of our neighborhoods. I think growing up in Los Angeles, I can tell you firsthand that not all, not all communities are created equal. And then not all budgets are created equal as well. And I think that part of the conversation that we have got to continue to have is how do we make sure that communities like ours, that communities of color are represented and that our budgets are reflected on their needs um, and their desires to improve their neighborhoods and improve their families and, and those of their children. And I think we began to do that, Melina, last year. And so I wanna to continue to have that conversation, have honest and difficult conversations. I don't shy away from them. And be honest with you, um, because that's what everyone deserves is an honest conversation about how difficult these decisions have been. I know I'm joined with a number of, of members of the city council that I'd like to give them an opportunity to say a few words, because I know we want to start the presentation as soon as possible, because we all have busy schedules. So I want to kick it off to Mr. Price from the new night. Thank you, sir, for being with us. I just want to give you a couple of seconds to introduce yourself thank you. and welcome to, to and thank you very much for making time to be here this evening you thank led a successful listening session a couple of weeks ago and i want to thank you for that as yes well. yes well thank you madam president my honor to join uh, with you my colleagues uh, our friends from black lives matter uh, milena uh you know i'm here to listen and to learn you know i'm cutting right to it listen and to learn i, I appreciated the opportunity to uh, doing with you last year, uh, looking forward to today's ongoing uh, 
conversation and commitment to make our our budget really reflect our values. And so I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Current. We also are joined by Council Member Mark Whitley Thomas, who I've had the pleasure of working with when he was on the Board of Supervisor on issues like human trafficking. So he's a partner, uh, a partner in a good fight, right, Mark? You and I have done some good work together. So thank you again for making the time for, to be here. All day long, Madam President and colleagues and to those who are on the call uh, here to oblige a request to uh, participate in this uh, conversation. It's a dynamic conversation. It's an ongoing conversation. It's well established that my top tier priority is that of homelessness, treating the question of a right to housing and advancing that in terms of the disproportionate impact that it has on people of color, particularly African-Americans. So um, it seems to me that the proposal that came forward last year and I presume this year address that crisis and if that's the case, I'm all about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we have our good friend, council member Marquise Harris Dawson, who I've known for years since he was at the Community Coalition. We've done some good work together for our respective communities and the chair of Plum. Hi, sir. Hey there, good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, it's very good to be here. I, I agree with all the comments that my, my colleagues have made. Uh, and I, I'll just take a point of per personal privilege uh, just to say how proud I am of our, our chapter, the Los Angeles chapter of, of Black Lives Matter uh, and the leadership, especially uh, Melina Abdullah, who uh, we've uh, known each other, it feels like forever. Uh, she points out she's a little bit younger than me. So uh, I think she might have been in middle school when we met. Uh, and uh, we met as young activists, both uh, taking instruction uh, from the 8th District Councilman Mark Ridley Thomas about what we needed to do in the community. And uh, so to be here tonight on uh, this, the stage of our city, uh, uh, doing the work uh, that we've dedicated our lives to, uh, creating change, uh, uh, kicking up dust, uh, disturbing the status quo, uh, I just couldn't be prouder. Uh, to be one, a member of the council, to serve with my colleagues, but especially to be here uh, with Black Lives Matter and Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Marquise. And Mr. Pro Tem, Senator Kevin De Leon, one of our newest members to the city council that was elected last year representing the 14th district. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam President, and, and to my colleagues. It's great to be with each and every one of you again. Uh, uh, Brother Marquise, I, I think I could take it maybe a little step further with uh, Melina, uh, being that uh, uh, I was her student, you know, uh, over at Scripps College uh, at the Claremont Colleges. Uh, and now she's a Golden Eagle over at Cal State LA. Uh, so we got that going. Uh, and I just want to say it's, it's an honor and pleasure to be here with each and every one of you and have an opportunity to talk about uh, policy making decisions that can improve the human condition for all individuals, regardless of who you are and regardless of where you come from, the color of your skin, regardless of which God you pray to, who you love, and yes, your legal status. So I'm going to leave it at that right there. I know there's a lot to talk, a lot for us to take in and absorb uh, and, and process, but uh, it's an honor uh, to be here uh, with each and every one of you. Gracias. Thank you, Kevin. Council Member Bonin, an ally to all of our communities and someone that we're really proud that I know that when the tough get Go and you stand with us in solidarity. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you for convening us for this. Thank you to uh, Melina and everybody else from, from BLM for allowing us to be a part of this and allowing us <clears throat> to listen. You know, uh, last time this conversation was happening, it was following, it was uh, sort of on the tail end of demonstrations where tens of thousands of people were taking to the street. People of all neighborhoods, of all communities, of all demographics. And in so many ways that taking to the streets was the easy moment, the easy moment for people to protest. That is then followed by the, the, the difficult and the hard conversations that Nuri referred to. And we started to begin to engage in those difficult and hard conversations in the last budget season. And those difficult and hard conversations lead to difficult and hard work to actually make the change that we all uh, see that we need. 
Uh, so I'm down for the difficult conversations and I'm down for the hard work. And the best thing I could do tonight is lend you my ear instead of my mouth. So I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And also we're joined by one of the newest council members to join us on the city council, councilwoman, Nathia Rahman, the third woman on the city council. Hi, Nathia. Nice to see you. Uh, and hi, everybody. Thank you. Um... Uh, Council President for uh, convening us all today um, and thank you to Black Lives Matter for organizing uh, this event today. This is my first budget cycle with the city and it's a uh, it's been a really interesting process to watch unfold and I'm really excited to hear more about what um, this forum will offer us and teach us and to see how we can incorporate some of those learnings into this budget process as we move through it. So thank you all very much for making space for me and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. I think that's it, back to you, Melina, that's seven of us. Great, well, thank you all so much for um, joining us again. Um, we wanna uplift, um, I'm grateful to have had relationships and have friendships with so many of you, some that go back until my junior high school days, I'll, I'll, I'll claim that Marquise um, and some that are new friendships. Um, and I want to uplift though, that this work is not my work, this is our work. Um, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles has hundreds of active members. We're the largest and one of the most active chapters in, Black, in the Black Lives Matter Global Network. Um, we also ascribe to what Mama Ella Baker called group-centered leadership. So all of us engage in this work and lead this work, and I'm grateful to be in community with so many brilliant leaders. I think as Marquise was talking about um, Mark Ridley Thomas's role when we were um, young activists, we also want to uplift um, Baba Akili, who I'm in community with, um, was one of the folks who trained up, trained up so many young activists, especially in the 90s, now I'm telling my age for real, especially in the 90s nurtured us and into real activism. Um, so we're grateful to continue to be in community with Baba Akili and as one of the leads of Black Lives Matter and Mama Paula Paula, I call her Mama Paula, you can call her Miss Paula Minor, um, was also one of my early bosses and continues to lead our police accountability team. I'm grateful to be in community with her and all of those who make Black Lives Matter their sacred duty. People's Budget LA is also bigger than Black Lives Matter. We lead the work, but we're grateful to be in partnership with many organizations, with Reverend, which Reverend Ray will talk about. So People's Budget, what is the People's Budget? We wanna kind of walk you into this and we're gonna do so as quickly as we can so we can get some feedback from you all, as well as feedback from those who are engaging us on Facebook. Um, so let's get into what the people's budget is. Um, we wanna make sure that we um, kind of outline, there's a lot of folks speaking. And so I'm gonna just take a couple of minutes to walk us through and then we'll walk through um, the rest of the presentation, especially the data and what we're imagining, what this kind of call to action that we have for you all. So the history of the people's budget, next slide please began at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, you will remember because all of you received letters that 55 black led community organizations um, throughout the County of Los Angeles came together with a less than 24 hours notice and saw this emergency that was um, developing in Los Angeles. We saw black people dying at two to three times the rate of everyone else as a result of COVID-19 and the economic fallout hit black communities the hardest. And we issued something quickly, Megan and I, who's on the line, um, stayed up virtually all night, not virtually, we stayed up all night, um, uh, really kind of putting into words what we had talked about in this five hour meeting, five hour marathon meeting about what it is we wanted. And we issued these black LA demands. We sent them to the mayor and we sent them to virtually every elected official in the County of Los Angeles. We didn't hear back from enough of you and we still haven't heard back from Mayor Garcetti about these black LA demands, but at the core of the black LA demands was that we need to be funding services not police. Just days later, or a few weeks later, 
Um, the mayor of the city issued his budget proposal, which, um, which, which sought to increase the funding to LAPD at a time when we needed it for mental health, for health, for um, economic development, for all of the things that were listed in the Black LA demands. Next slide. And so the foundation of the people's budget really dates back to the birth of Black Lives Matter in 2013, um, but really began to kind of gain some steam as we issued those Black LA demands. And we started putting out some tweets. We were insulted by the fact that the mayor didn't meet with us. We were insulted by the fact that he didn't even bother to respond. We were insulted by the budget proposal that completely ignored what it was, not just Black Lives Matter was saying we needed, but what Africatown Coalition said we needed, what Black Women for Wellness said we needed, what the NAACP said we needed. And so we formed the People's Budget Coalition in May of 2020, and were invited in to, um, you know, May 25th, we um, saw the world crack wide open when George Floyd's life was stolen. And so Black Lives Matter, we had already issued um, these people's budget um, demands. We were in the midst of developing the people's budget survey. It was out in the field. And then George Floyd is murdered and the world cracks wide open. And as we're out in the streets, we're still doing budget work, defund the police, which had been something that we were saying becomes the clarion call of the moment. It's much more than a snappy slogan. It is a policy demand. And it was recognized by then city council president, Herb Wesson, who convened many of you um, as we were invited to present the people's budget before city council in June of 2020. Next slide, please. After we made that presentation, we worked with many of you to do town halls, to do direct actions, but more than you, we worked with tens of thousands of Angelinos to uplift these demands. We asked many of you to sign participatory budgeting pledges and we engaged in a modeling of what participatory budgeting is holding town halls, preparing a budget proposal and issuing that budget proposal. Um, then we began doing budget advocacy work. Um, we prepared a budget proposal for this budget cycle as well and began advocating around what the implementation of the 2020-2021 budget should look like after the mayor of the city had had to kind of um, address the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes people in the street and committed to $250 million to Black Los Angeles and other communities of color. As we saw very little of that money getting to our neighborhoods, we began to engage city council around the 2020, 2021 budget saying that that needs to go to black communities through black led organizations, but also working towards the 2021, 2022 budget. Next slide, please. And so we did participatory budgeting engagement. We had um, a series of town halls that included experts. We did um, some work out in the parks, socially distanced, right? We were invited to some of your town halls to offer presentations. Um, thank you to Mike Bonin and Herb Wesson and others who had us speak before their constituents. Next slide, please. And we achieved several things. We um, issued that um, initial survey where 25,000 respondents said that they wanted to fund services, not police. Um, we were um, encouraged when Herb Wesson and Nuri Martinez issued a motion so that um, nonviolent calls would be moved away from police and were eager to see that put into place. We saw the mayor um, commit to cutting LAPD budget by $150 million and $250 million pledged to Black Los Angeles and other communities of color. The Bon and Harris Dawson motion to remove police from traffic stops is still moving and we need to get it to move quickly, right? We saw a 35% cut to LAUSD police. We passed Measure J in the county. And we lobbied again for funding to go to black communities through black led organizations. Next slide, please. And so the budget that we've seen issued by the mayor of the city doesn't do any of the things that we've requested. 
Next slide, please. It again spends too much on LAPD. 46% of the unrestricted funds, $3.1 billion is slated to go to LAPD when we know that LAPD does not provide safety to our communities. We need those dollars for things like our, our, the fractions, right? We need those dollars for libraries, for rec and parks, for all of those other areas. Next slide, please. We know that this has been what Garcetti has been doing throughout his uh, tenure as mayor, increasing the budget for LAPD, succumbing to the very narrow special interests of the LA Police Protective League and Mayor Michael Moore. Next slide, please. And so we are asking city council to reject this proposal. We're saying we wanna fund services, not police. Next slide, please. And so we're demanding a just but budget, not the so-called justice budget that was introduced by the mayor. And the people stand with us. You listened for hours today. You listened for hours last week as the people over and over again said defund the police, spend on the things that actually create safe communities. The people demand the defunding of the police and the funding of resources in our city. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Reverend Ray Wong, who is gonna talk about budgets as moral documents. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Molina, um, for, for leading that. Um, as she shared earlier, this coalition was convened by Black Lives Matter LA last May as a response to the Black LA demands created collectively by the Black community leaders here in Los Angeles. And as you can see here listed in front of you, these organizations um, vary across race, class, sexuality, geography, and faith. And they all joined because of our shared experiences of police violence and neglect based on our location in society and our shared need for real substantial changes and resources for our people. You can um, close the slide now. As a pastor and community leader, time and time again, what I hear from our communities, what I hear from my people and our people here in LA is that we are struggling to survive. What we need today is fair wages and good jobs. What we need today is good schools and good healthcare. What we need is childcare and so forth. But instead we're pouring our money into a system that has never been there to protect us, but to protect instead the wealthy and those with power and privilege in our city. I will tell you that recently in the last couple months, especially as I'm meeting with other Asian community leaders responding to the targeted violence against us, every single time in my calls, our Asian leaders have been calling not to increase police protection, but instead to raise awareness of the systemic racism that Asians have encountered since the beginning of our arrival here in this country. The thing is black folks, the poor people of color, LGBT, our families on the margins are either targeted by police, thrown into jail cells, or historically ignored in our poor ethnic enclaves, such as Chinatown and Little Tokyo, to name a few. From the beginning of the institution of the police, the police was there to protect and serve one peoples, not everybody. My friends, as a clergy person who is a part of the Clergy for Black Lives, it is time to reimagine a healthier city that actually protects and creates a safe place, not just for the privileged, but actually where all thrive. In a state that has one of the wealthiest economies in the world today, we have enough wealth in our state. We have enough wealth in our own city to create a real sustainable reparative city. We have the wealth for dignified jobs in a local thriving economy. We have the wealth for good public education. We have the wealth for mental health resources. We have the wealth for housing for all. I could go on, but we've been squandering it. My friends, we can say as many times as we want that we stand with Black Lives Matter, but we all know that the truth lies in what we do and not just what we say. The people, our people, the people of LA are waiting to see our leaders put our money where our mouth is. If you do truly believe that Black Lives Matter, that poor people and people of color, immigrants and LGBT are a part of LA, 
This budget is where you must demonstrate that commitment. And that is why we're here today. We are inviting you to push back against what Garcetti has put forth and take the opportunity to show true leadership for our city. In this moment, I'm very honored to introduce you to somebody that I see not just as an organizer, but a powerful spiritual leader for me um, and for many others in Los Angeles. Paula Miner is a member of uh, Black Lives Matter and she'll be leading our next section on defund the police and why this is a spiritual fight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Paula Meyer, and I'm glad to participate in our presentation tonight to the various council members. And I thank the council people for spending their time listening to us. Um, not only is the budget a moral document, as Reverend Ray said, but the budget of a city lets everyone know what this city holds as important and what the city values. Unfortunately, the mayor is recommending again that most of the city's money should go to the police. We call on you, the city council, to reject the mayor's increase to LAPD and to reject any request for additional funds that LAPD makes as they respond to the criticism of how they handled last summer's protests with excessive violence and inappropriate responses. They should not be rewarded for their failure. People all over the city have agreed with the concept of defunding the police. Defund the police is not harmful, negative, or difficult. It's practical. It means to divest from police funding and invest in resources that will sustain and improve the quality of life for all citizens, but especially for those in communities which are black, brown, and poor. Next slide this slide. By divesting from policing and funding and investing in important community needs and programs, these tax, tasks and responsibilities now assigned to the police can and should be done by others who are trained and experienced in doing them, tasks that do not require armed responders. Police presence often turns a nonviolent situation into a violent one, causing unneeded harm and not solving problems. So situations like these do not need police. Parties and noise complaints, domestic and family con conflicts, substance abuse situations, public transportation, homelessness, wellness checks, street vending, car accident, mental health crisis, housing, eviction, libraries, schools, parks. We do not need police in these areas. Um, police, including the LAPD chief, have said publicly they don't want to be responsible for all these non-policing social service tasks. They don't want to do them. Police are trained to be armed responders and work within a military framework, which looks for an enemy and identifies people as suspects. In LA, black, brown, and poor people are the enemy, as evidenced by the military equipment, the military procedures and the terminology such as the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on homelessness. And because the primary tool these responders are trained to use is a gun, the results of their solutions and problem solving are negative, harmful, and too often deadly. Next slide. So what can and should be done to defund the police and improve public safety as the community has asked? Changes like the motions introduced by you, the city council, the motion to create an unarmed crisis response that would divert nonviolent calls for service away from LAPD. The motion to develop alternative transportation policy models and methods that don't rely on police to enforce or handle routine traffic laws. These two motions were introduced and approved in June 2020, nearly one year ago. Changes like these must be expedited and funded as part of the proposed new budget. Change must not just be talked about and written about, you have to make the change. So, last slide. So, we, as we say, as thousands of people have said, defund the police, invest in the people their needs and the resources to meet those needs. Having fewer unnecessary contacts with police makes the community safer. Funding the things and services for people helps heal the community and makes it better and stronger and ultimately not need the police. And now I'll turn it over to Gilbert Johnson of Californians for Safety and Justice, Gilbert. Yo, what's up? What's up, y'all? Glad to be here in this space with everybody. 
Uh, and as you all know, my name is Gilbert Johnson. I'm a native of South Central Los Angeles, proud, proud constituent of the great Ape. Shout out to my brother Marquise and just to this amazing team. You know, the People's Budget LA has been engaging residents across Los Angeles regarding um, spaces for abolition and just how we should be defunding the police for about a year and a half now. And the community has been clear and specific with where they would like to see their tax dollars invested. And so, you know, as a native of South Central, I know that the addiction, crime, and violence that has long existed uh, in this community derives from generational poverty, the over-reliance on law and order rather than meeting people's actual needs, and the laws that were intended to create the socioeconomic conditions in communities like mine, like South LA. And so um, you could go to the next slide uh, through creating uh, so many spaces where the community at large can truly voice their opinions and concerns and truly be heard. You know, that's key in this discussion. Our people are really heard by People's Budget LA. The community's priorities have remained consistent. And so you can see here that the people want more investments towards housing security, public health care, mental health treatment, and Black-owned small businesses who have been um, hit the hardest and suffered the most during COVID-19. And so that's remained consistent. You can skip to the next slide. But also through this second phase of surveying, a few more themes and a, a few more issues have been lifted and elevated. And so the first one on the next slide talks about really investing in um, services and programs that support, that provide support for black families and children to help keep black, black families together and combat the criminalization and victimization that can come with the child welfare system. So you'll see our sister Lamikia's um, comment right there. And, and it's real, it's very real it's stuff that we've been dealing with for decades. And so we need more intentional investments into supporting um, black families and children. Uh, next slide. We also uh, saw that more that people wanted more, you know, Doc mentioned Measure J and we got the alternatives to incarceration. There's a lot of movement in the criminal justice reform area and the conversation around building out a community based system of care. So people want more investment in supportive services for formerly incarcerated or what we call system impacted folks. Uh, to ensure that resource connection and that we're preventing recidivism, you know, that revolving door of folks going in and coming out and going right back in. So um, that's another one that was lifted. You can go to the next slide. We also saw that folks uh, are taking into the account, taking into account and being mindful of the current conditions when it comes to education um, and the need for, uh, you know, after school and youth programs to really support the development that invests in our future because their future is our future, right? And this, through these investments, we can help break, break the pipelines to the criminal injustice system and really meet the needs of some of our most vulnerable populations. And so um, on to the next one. And last but not least, we also realize um, that there has been a technological divide since COVID. And so we need to invest more resources and dollars into um, you know, access to technology um, to ensure that all of our children, all children should have access to equal educational opportunities. You shouldn't be less than or have to deal with more disparities because you live in a certain zip code. And so you can go to the next one, which really highlights uh, some of the black led organizations that it's a list uh, that, that myself and brother Akila came up with, Akila Sherell, shout out, I, um, that came up with that, to, that highlights the work, the much needed community driven intervention and prevention work that has been proven to reduce violence um, in communities across the nation, not just here, but there's overwhelming data that supports all of these organizations you see right here that are out there in the streets, out there in the trenches, putting their life on the line, not showing up with a badge and a gun drawn and, and cuffs pulled out, but showing up from a place of compassion and empathy and trying to reduce conflict, right? And so it's this type of work is what I believe, I've seen it work hands-on, I've been involved in that work. And so shout out to all the folks that are listed right here. And then on the next slide, y'all already know, ain't nothing changed. The community at large has been loud and clear when we demand 
defund the police so that we can be funding all, everything that we just talked about. It's, it's, it's a clarion call, y'all, and, and it's the people saying this. So hopefully we all adhere to this. And then on the next slide right here, you can see my brother and comrade Carlos Cazares. Uh, he said, we're done paying for an institution that produces racism, violence, and poverty. We're done talking. It's time to put money where the people are at. And so thank you all for, for this time. Appreciate y'all, no doubt. All power to the people. All power to the people. And we just want to lift up the tremendous work that went into developing the People's Budget LA survey. Um, last year, we had soon to be Dr. David Turner. He's working on his dissertation now, but helped us to craft this survey along with Dr. Tabitha Jones Jolivet and Dr. Kimberly McNair. Dr. Kim McNair is a professor of African-American studies at Stanford University. She's a member of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, and she'll be presenting the quantitative data that's coming through the current survey so far. Dr. McNair. Thank you, Melina. It is a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. If you could, please go to the next slide. All right, so uh, this is the people's budget, and uh, the people's budget is a result of a process of public engagement, sustained engagement over the last year, and uh, it's this process of public participatory budgeting, and we've had a series of six public town halls with thousands of participants, and just to tell you about these numbers here, we had 4,271 people to respond, and just to give you a quick comparative, there is an LMU study out there that um, people like to quote, that LMU study had uh, 1700 people, 1700 people respond. And what we have gathered here in two weeks, we gathered double that amount, right? Over 4,200 people responded. So um, that is an amazing, an amazing effort. And we had many Angelinos respond to us and that's really, that's really great. And so this is just a testament to the fact that many people are still um, consistent with their responses from last year's study that they are consistently supporting defunding the police. If you could go to the next slide. All right, uh, so we had responses from one, those who are most marginalized in our communities. We wanted to ensure that our city's most neglected voices were heard. So we have responses uh, from a diverse population of people from every uh, council district, race, gender, all levels of em employment who participated in this study. So uh, that's, that's the pool that we are pulling this information from. Next slide. So a bit on our prelim preliminary demographics, you can go to the next slide. Okay. So we have a diversity, a diversity of respondents, a diversity of perspectives represented here in the 36.3% uh, uh, of people who have identified as crime survivors. So this illustrates the impacts of a failed system, understanding that those who are crime survivors often understanding that police don't prevent crime, right? So how else might we be able to invest in communities to help prevent crime and come up with other solutions other than the police? Uh, those who are incarcerated and impacted by the carceral system, 11.9%. And our, our way to define uh, the carceral system includes those who have been arrested, incarcerated, or who are on parole, right? But most importantly, look at this number, 31.8%, uh, the number 31.8% being respondents who've been impacted, their family members were impacted by the carceral system, understanding that families and communities get caught in this web of criminalization created by the failed system of policing. So it's very important to, to see that number and understand its impact as well. 31.8% of respondents to this study, that's 1,358 people. 1,358 people who themselves were not incarcerated themselves, but their families were directly impacted by this failed system. Next slide. So um, 
other other experiences and responses that we discovered here our experiences with law enforcement in particular having 14.3 percent of persons who were directly harmed by law enforcement um, and 24.3 people who had family members directly harmed by law enforcement again we felt it important to include the voice of those directly impacted by policing and just to give you a comparison this 14.3 percent that's actually 610 people this 24.3 percent that is over 1,000 people about 1,038 people so just to give you a comparison uh, a certain vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. Uh, they had issues of blood clotting in a specific population, and they, they had a handful of people get sick from blood clots when over 7 million people had received that specific vaccine for COVID-19, and they paused that vaccine, right? They paused giving that vaccine just by that handful of people. I don't even think they let the number get to 10, right? A certain company that produces exercising equipment, I'm not calling any names, but it's exercise equipment that's really, really popular these days. They had one death and 70 people were injured. One death and 70 people were injured um, with that exercise equipment, and they recalled the entire exercise equipment that that model has been recalled completely right so if you compare that to 611 people who have been harmed by the police and over 1,000 people who have had family members harms it makes you scratch your head and wonder where the priorities are when we think about the well-being of Angelinos and the priorities of the mayor and the city next slide so as far as perspectives, understanding that there's 91% of respondents who support nonviolent direct action. And as someone who does a bit of work around uh, media discursive activism in um, uh, Black uh, studies in particular, understanding that this goes against the narrative that people feel unsafe during BLM demonstrations and other demonstrations about ending anti-Black policing, right? 91% of persons overwhelmingly supporting nonviolent direct action. And you have 93% of people who say that police associations should not have a role in the city budget. Why would they have a role in the city budget when we understand that, of course, they're not going to vote to decrease their own budgets, right, as a line item. So it doesn't make any sense to have them a part of this uh, process. Next slide. Next slide, we're going to talk about some of the survey results. So as far as our universal needs and priorities, uh, one, of the, one of the highest ranking uh, universal needs being the need of the communities overall, but specifically and especially Black communities in particular, understanding that universal needs are something that we all share and it shouldn't be politicized, but it is. Um, housing security, understanding that we have a housing crisis in Los Angeles County, but uh, that is something that people want to be prioritized that is not currently prioritized over the police. Next slide. Um, Reimagining community safety. I, I'm thinking about Reverend Huang's comments, and I'm also thinking about Gilbert's comments and thinking about that biblical question who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And the response being, my neighbor is the person who shows mercy. Your neighbor is the person who shows care right? Um, and empathy. And so when we're thinking about reimagining community safety, understanding that one, overwhelmingly 76% of respondents believing that mental health and wellness support should be a priority for the city, right? And understanding that mental, mental illness itself is not a crime. So something that definitely needs to be uh, reimagined in particular. Restorative justice, uh, restorative justice being the second highest respondent as far as uh, people wanting that to be a priority and understanding that punitive, punitive justice, systems of justice uh, fail often. And we've seen evidence of that time and time again. Next slide. The built environment. One thing to point out in the built environment and, and, and to think about my own personal anecdote <laughs> I'm someone who's uh, experienced having uh, a 20 hour commute uh, every week for work. So the built environment, investing in public transportation libraries and other things that the community utilizes should take priority over the police. Next slide. Um, and here you will see that no one uh, in the survey actually voted to increase the budget 
for uh, the police and the sheriff's department. So again, where are uh, the priorities in line and lock and step with the constituents? When here we can see that they overwhelmingly support defunding the police and reinvesting in communities. Next slide. So our data demonstrates a consistent commitment investment in universal needs and a divestment from traditional forms of policing. Next slide. And now I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Kendrick Sampson, activist and organizer with Build, Build Power. Hey, 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 what's up? Uh, my name is Kendrick Sampson, I'm an actor, um, and I am the co-founder of Build Power. Uh, I'm just jump right into it. I wanna talk a little bit uh, about reimagining safety. Um, since a lot of my job is just to imagine, right? Um, I'm just gonna be real with y'all. If we can't imagine better than this budget and these violent systems that present such a low bar, we have no imagination, right? We are not trying. Uh, we should be far ahead of the rest of the country and leading the country in imagining. We have the mecca of the film industry here, right? People get paid to imagine here. And I'll even say city council gets paid to imagine, right? To imagine better policy and outcomes for its constituents and then for our people, right? And then of course, move on that imagination, right? To, to apply it to action. Uh, the systems we have that we're investing the most money in started from bad seeds, like policing, right? Started from slave catching. And I like to think of it like uh, I used to learn in church, a bad seed produces a bad tree, produces bad fruit. A good seed produces a good tree, produces good fruit, right? So we need to uproot the systems that started with bad seeds. And we need to plant good seeds that are founded in care, right? That are founded in wellness, that are founded in, in restorative justice, right? Let's plant those good seeds. I'd like you to take a second and just imagine with me. Can you imagine health and wellness at the center of all of our systems and considerations for safety? Imagine a budget that reflects those priorities. That's what will keep us safe. That is what will keep us safe. That's not the budget that we currently have or the one that's being proposed by Mayor Garcetti, right? Our safety lies in ensuring communities' ability to have autonomy over their wellness. We need solutions that address the root of problems. Right now, our systems force trauma and poor health on the most vulnerable communities. They were created to do that, and they will continue to do so because they started with bad seeds, and they produce bad trees, and they're bearing bad fruit. Imagine a world where even the people with the most obstacles, physical, mental, historical, and cultural obstacles are the most supported in our society. Imagine that world. Imagine a budget where the largest investments overwhelmingly go to infrastructure for healing, for job support, for mental health care, and rapid response for mental health crises for care and healing for those suffering from addiction, for housing, education, specialized community-based non-law enforcement, violence intervention programs and prevention, other forms of care for our community, for our people. Imagine how many jobs can be created in these areas so that people can live and work and thrive right there within their community. If more people are able to stay and work close to home, it might even ease up some of this awful LA traffic, right? Imagine restorative justice programs that get to the root of the problem for harm that was done and focusing on healing and centering humanity instead of investing the bulk of our tax dollars in systems like policing and prisons that only make the harm worse and introduce new harm into already harmful scenarios. Imagine big budgets, big budgets for after school programs and counselors and mental health care in school that see children, black children as what they are, children, 
not statistics, not potential gang members or any other anti-black dehumanizing framing that roots all the way back to the bad seed of slavery. Imagine immense support for community-based programs that train and employ elders and peers that know each black and brown child by name and experience and see them as the future leaders that they are instead of stealing their potential and forcing a terrible future on them before they even get out of elementary school. Can you visualize with me programs that transform food deserts into communities with the healthiest food, land, water, and air quality? Can you see in your mind programs that support the local black economies and keep residents there instead of creating the conditions that encourage gentrification? That's the kind of budget that we want to realize for our children, right? Can you imagine your job as city council overseeing that kind of budget in that kind of city, how much better could you feel coming to work every day? Wouldn't that budget make more sense? Because right now it don't. It's not idealistic, it's just right. And it's not that hard to imagine. It's a reality that exists right here in LA for wealthy, predominantly white communities. What will your legacy be? What headlines will your children and your children's children look back in the archives and find with your name on them? I'm gonna leave y'all with that question and that imagining and that seed hopefully planted in your soul so that you can translate that into policy and challenge this budget and get it in the right shape. I'm gonna pass the baton to the awesome, amazing Baba Keely with Black Lives Matter. Thank you so much, Kendrick. Uh, and to the city council, listen, you all just heard some powerful presentations, but you know we've been here before. We were here during the Christopher uh, Commission. We were here during the, uh, after the Watts uprising. We have been here many times before. We have been here and should have been here many times before. We should have been here in, 2000, in 1919 after the Red Summer and the Elaine Arkansas massacre. We should have been here, and you've heard this before, after the Wall Street killings of 300 black people in 1921. In my lifetime, I have seen the killings of Emmett Till and the impact that, here, that has had. Every gener black person and every generation has had this kind of black murder of black murders that have impacted them, whether it was Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Quishario Mack, Riddell Jones, Breonna Taylor, and hundreds more. And that's a heavy price for any people to pay. We are here because of black death, quite frankly. And as Dr. Martin Luther King wrote in his letters from the Birmingham jails to the good white people at the time, black people can't wait. There is no better time than now. Many people have been awakened by what they've seen and by these conditions. But a lot of people ain't up. A lot of people still hitting the snooze button. And what we are calling for now is for the city council to get up. We think you're woke, but are you up? We think you know what's happening, but are you up? And so it's going beyond being woke. It's moving to getting up. It's going beyond thinking, ah, Black Lives Matter uh, as a slogan, as a phrase, as something that you feel good about. And so these are some of the, what we are calling for the city to do. And I'm gonna ask if you would put up these five points. The first thing we're asking you to do is reject this increase that the LAPD is requesting, the $67 million. We cannot reward failure. There's been three reports that have said LAPD has failed. So reject that. Secondly, make the people's budget an official part of the city's budgeting process. Look at what we have been able to do within two weeks. We have contacted, heard from, and had, and had over 4,000 people participate with us. That's more than you've had. The other thing is we're calling on you to do is implement the two motions that were passed last year, removing police from traffic, uh, stops and removing police from nonviolent calls. That's a simple thing. It's in the works now. Let's move it further faster and get it done. And then 
The fourth thing is prioritize funding for black led organizations. Too often our organizations have been starved while we have fed the police and that police has, the LAPD has not made us safe. And then finally, remove police from places they really don't belong. We don't need the police at the parks. We certainly don't need them in our schools and our after schools program. We definitely don't need them patrolling our housing, uh, community housing projects and in libraries and in the Metro. So these are five things that you can do now. These are five things that as we move forward, you can say, yes, we can do that. Now, I'm sure there are at least hundreds of reasons why you will give yourself why you can't do it. We are looking for some one reason to do it. If you are stand, willing to stand with Black Lives Matters and the Black community and people of color communities in this city, then do these things. Support the people's budget and reimagine, rethink, reconsider a better LA, a different LA, an LA that Kendrick just alluded to, that Kendrick just outlined, that we have all advanced, that we have all called for. And so now it's your turn, it's on you, and we're calling on you. I know you can, the question is, will you? We are going to also call on our larger community. Call your city council, be in touch with them, stay engaged. You know, and a year round, don't just use this one opportunity and then fill out the, the, uh, the survey. We still need those surveys. And anytime the people stop holding their feet, our feet to the fire, quite frankly, city council walks away from their commitments. So we gotta keep our voices, our positions heard and present all the time. Thank you. So what we've heard is um, a demand that comes not from Black Lives Matter, not even from the People's Budget LA Coalition, but from Angelinos across the city to fund services, not police, to adopt a people's budget, to be courageous and be willing to reject the mayor's budget and embrace what the people are telling you that we need. And so we'd love to hear back from the city council members who are here about what you've heard, any questions that you have, um, and then we'll engage the rest of the community that's joining us on Facebook. So council members, beginning with Council President Martinez, do you have <laughs> back for us? Is that okay to turn back my video? Please, please, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I agree with a lot of your presentation on the, especially that the ones that, all of it that highlights all the needs to invest in, in things like education, public health care, housing, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I hope that other entities of government are actually listening to this, such as the state and the county. Uh, and having said that, the city is responsible for building. And so I absolutely agree um, that you, and we have a need and, and an urgent, um, uh, mandate to build permanent supportive housing. There is no question that that is our mandate and our obligation. But the city does not, um, this is, we don't directly fund education and we don't directly fund public health. So in these conversations, this continues to come up. And, you know, part of my frustration is when are we going to hold other city government entities also accountable to funding these types of services that our community so desperately need. For example, Measure J, um, as you all said at the beginning of the presentation, you were all very involved in making sure that Measure A was, was passed. It allocates $1 billion towards various youth programs. Well, so far, um, according to the to last information that I got, the city uh, will not see any of those money and right now, the county is debating and deliberating over their, their budget. So when are we going to ask for dollars for the city of LA when it comes to Major J? Because we need them just as much as the rest of the county does. And so these are the things that I'm, I sometimes feel very frustrated with. Um, like I said, issues like public health and mental health are all common issues that I see in my neighborhoods every time I'm out there talking to my community, especially when it comes to the unhoused. And these are 
the types of services that we desperately need, but they're not necessarily within the jurisdiction of the, the LA City Council, the city of Los Angeles. So I need for all of us to work together to ensure that these other government age entities are listening to your presentation and that we're demanding that these services get allocated to communities of color. So that's my takeaway. I hope that we can continue to have this dialogue. The city council will start to deliberate uh, the budget in the next two weeks. I know there's over 260 uh, budget memos that were introduced in, uh, in the budget committee over the course of last week and this week. So there's a lot of debating, a lot of things that we're gonna be discussing. So I hope that a lot of what you presented today is something that we get to do that on the city council. I don't know if there's an, any other members um, that are still on, if you would like to share your thoughts about what you've heard. Sure. Yes. Hi, Nary Curran here. Am I on? Can you hear me? You're I on. can hear you, but but why don't I just turn it over to Melina and she okay. can. Okay. All right. Councilman Price, go ahead. I just want to say thank you uh, to uh, the presenters. Uh, I think uh, presentations were thoughtful, certainly uh, passionate, and. Um, and right on point, you know, as a member of the budget committee uh, on the council, I, I'm keenly aware uh, that what is what we do, that not what we say. Uh, and so uh, I just appreciate the uh, uh, comments uh, and the, um, the points that were made, you know, you know, basic income, some steps we've taken that I've been leading on unarmed responses, uh, alternative traffic enforcement, uh, modes are, uh, are a start. But I think clearly we need to be doing more. We gotta be doing a lot more. I, I agree that we need more investment in the community and especially as it impacts our families, our children and our families. And so uh, I'm, I'm committed to, to working with my colleagues, uh, making sure that uh, you know, we're able to move the needle, that we're able to establish um, a new pri new set of priorities that, that really do reflect our community and our aspirations for uh, for moving forward. So again, I just appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this uh, this presentation and uh, look forward to your continued input uh, as we go through this process. Nuri mentioned that uh, uh, the next council hearing will be on the about two weeks, uh, but this is the time uh, to. Uh, make these thoughts, make these ideas known and, and advance them as you can. Uh, but I appreciate the chance of being a part of, a part of the discussion. Thank you, Councilman Price. Are there other council members who wanna offer feedback? And we wanna encourage you um, to think about this, not just as a presentation that was inspiring, right? But also as a presentation that can help inform how you relate to the mayor's budget proposal, right? So I think um, Councilman Bonin was gonna speak next. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the, the, the presentation. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was thoughtful, it was informative, uh, and it was, uh, 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 th th there were moments that were powerful just as it was when it was before the, the, the members of the council and chambers uh, last year. So thank you for doing it again. Um, you know, at the beginning, I talked about how the easy part was last year during the protests when people from all over were coming, and then the hard conversations started happening, and then, and then the hard work, and every time that happens, the circle sort of gets smaller, um, and that's sort of where we are, um, and we need to expand the circle again. Uh, Baba Akili talked uh, uh, and asked us, why are, why are we still here? Why, after the Christopher Commission, after the civil unrest of 1992, uh, after all of these incidents in the past, why are we still here? And part of the reason we're still here is that every moment of protest, every moment of imagination has been faced with pushback. And I'm hearing a lot of pushback. And it, I think it is up to us now to push through the pushback. Um, and I think we do that by beginning where there's common ground. Everybody, everybody wants to feel safe. But so many of us have been conditioned to believe that the only way to be safe is call 911 for the police to come. Uh, and so I was very moved by, by Kendrick's call for us to imagine something different. Voters in LA County certainly did when they approved Measure J, which is a great example and template for us to go. Uh, I can relate to that call a lot on a very personal level. 
Uh, I, um, uh, I, I'm now uh, uh, 26 years sober, but I was deep into alcoholism and, and, and drug addiction in my youth. And the daily struggle of trying to get out of that and get sober was all about being able to imagine something different. Most days I would say to myself, this is how it is. This is what I deserve. I couldn't imagine something different and something better. And it was in that moment of sort of grace when I was able to imagine something different that I began to, to turn things around. And I think Los Angeles uh, can do that too. I think Los Angeles wants to make the change. We just have to explain better how uh, we're not, we, we are trying to improve and enhance safety. And the way to do it is through the health and through the wellness and through the housing, through the built environment and through all the services that you talked about, many of which are not city, uh, many of which the county and the feds and the state need to do and many of which the city can do. As for the five principles uh, that, that, that Baba Akili outlined, uh, on number one, the $67 million increase, uh, I absolutely support you in, in, in rejecting that. As, as one of the makers of the motion that called for the after action report, we never imagined the response to an after action report about the, 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 the problems at the, at the, uh, with, the, with the police behavior at the protest would result in a call for additional police resources. Uh, that, that, that one, uh, th th there's no way that should result in additional resources for LAPD. They need more training, that's great. They should do it out of what they have. Uh, making people's budget LA part of the budget process. Sure, we, this is the second year in a row we've done it. I think we should do it with people's budget. We've done it increasingly over the years with, with, uh, with many of our civilian employee unions and with neighborhood councils. We should expand the circle of participatory budgeting. Approve those two motions? Absolutely. Uh, Marquise and I are the authors of, of one of them. I vigorously support both of them. Um, support Black-led organizations? Absolutely. The council made an investment in that. I would love to see us do more and include, um, for, for me, I want to see that we, we support Black-led organizations, even in communities that have a majority white audience. I'd love to see the Helper Foundation and organizations in Venice and in Mar Vista Gardens get support as well. Uh, and as for moving police out of uh, where they don't belong, uh, I, I oppose the motion to uh, arm our park rangers. And I'm very fortunate to be on the LA Metro board and on Metro, uh, I've been pushing to actually do that transformation and move away from uh, armed law enforcement and from fair evasion there. And um, uh, we're moving ahead uh, uh, with some, some speed at Metro. Uh, we ain't there yet, but we're moving on it. And um, I'm glad to, to see more of it and happy to continue working on it. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Thank you for coming and thank you for that feedback. Are there other council members still on who would like to offer other words or feedback or commitments? Uh, I am still on and uh, I wanted to uh, join the course of, of comments. I have a few notes that we made during the, the various uh, moving prison, uh, presentation. Uh, the first thing I, I, I want to say, uh, and it, it is it is a statement of inspiration, but it's also a statement of thanks, uh, because you all have dramatized in a very material and concrete way, something that as a Black person, you just kind of live with, and uh, it isn't always validated by the outside world. And that is that Black people are disproportionately represented among homelessness, among those stopped by the police, those arrested by the police, those shot by the police, those getting the worst educational outcomes, those getting the worst health outcomes, uh, those with the worst, uh, highest housing burden, that is not a coincidence. That's a system. Uh, and those things work together across different parts, uh, different uh, organs of, uh, of the state and, uh, and of government. And I think it's right I think council president is right that there needs to be pressure on all of them, but I think the pressure needs to continue to be on the city as well, because the city replicates that system just like all the other ones do. And uh, the only way we stop it is if we confront it and face it uh, and, and deal with it. Specific commitment I want to make in addition to the ones uh, in, that you all have outlined is when we put forward the traffic motion and the reimagined motion, we did that for two reasons. One, we feel like having a broken tail light or, or any other kind of vehicle malfunction 
shouldn't be met uh, by confrontation by an armed government worker. So we firmly believe that, like that is just uncalled for and unnecessary and inefficient. But also we wanna unpack all of the things that have been conceded to or piled on the police department. And once we unpack those things, this is the important thing that we all have to watch. There should be money attached to that. So if we don't have police officers chasing people who run red lights or do other things, then that should mean less money for law enforcement and more money for the things that you all outlined. I say that we have to watch that because we've all been a part of this process over the last 10 years where we had AB 109 and Prop 57 and Prop 47, where we reduced the jail population. But here's the trick. The jail population got reduced, but we never saw the money go into the services uh, that Kendrick and other people uh, pointed out. And so I want to see this all the way through. So we, th those, those functions uh, have to be removed from the police department and put to more appropriate, uh, more, more appropriate responses. But the money also ought to, got to move. So if we remove all these functions, the police department shouldn't need the same amount of money that it needs, that it, that it claims to need now. And so uh, I, I'm committed to seeing that through and, and, threading, and, and threading that needle all the way through until we get to, to where we need, need to be. The other thing that I would point out, and this is by way of feedback, and, and I know everybody on the call knows this, but I just want to say it out loud uh, in recognition of a lot of you know, my constituents and my, my residents. Cities in general, and Los Angeles is no different, as rich as this country is, are underfunded. So people have to wait several years to get their sidewalk fixed. Uh, they have to wait several months or, or sometimes years to get a tree trimmed. Uh, and basic city services that a, that a civilized city should be able to provide, we can't provide. Part of that is because of our over-reliance on law enforcement. But part of that is just because there, there aren't enough uh, resources. And so as we're imagining a, a new city where the city serves the interest of the people, it's a city that has much more uh, access to resources and the ability to marshal resources to in fact provide the quality uh, the quality services that people require and to prepare our people to deliver those services uh, to their neighbors. And so uh, with that, again, thank you all. Uh, honored to be a part of this discussion and, and look forward to continuing to be a part of the push. Thank you, thank you. I know Nuri Martinez has to hop off and we just wanna thank Council President Martinez before she goes for helping us to convene um, this group and helping us to make sure that the people's budget process um, and presentation is part of the um, budgeting process. And so Nuri, as you go, we want to um, thank you and wish your mother well. We know that you have family obligations with your thank mom. Um, and so I asked if I could share that and you said your life is an open book. So <laughs> sharing, um, no, I we appreciate yeah. Thank kind of you. Away from family time to be with us. Yeah, and I also said it's messy and it's cray cray. Right. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I do <laughs> have. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were we were texting back and forth about all our obligations and all the people that we're in charge of and all the people we got to take care of. But I thank you very much for making me a part of this, Melina. You have access to me. Um, you know, we talk on a regular basis and after hours, and we have very candid, very. Um, uh, honest conversations with each other about how important the work that we're doing is and how we hold each other accountable. So I want to thank you for, for that. And also just reiterate, equity has always been part of my, uh, my work. Um, eight years ago when I got to the city council, I wasn't even supposed to get elected and I ended up here anyways. And equity as popular as it may seem now is something that I've been fighting for every single day on this council. And I'm not gonna stop fighting for that. So thank you for having me and members of uh, who are continue to stay on. Thank you guys for, for being part of this. And we're gonna continue to have this dialogue, these dialogues um, in years to come. I'm committed to doing that and committing to a transparent process. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. And council members Raman and uh, Ridley Thomas are still on. I'm wondering if you want to offer any feedback. Yeah, I'm happy to just say a few words. Um, 
Uh, I want to echo a lot of the comments made by my colleagues today. Gratitude for the presentation and for the work that you've put in and for the priorities that have been outlined. Um, Kendrick, your vision of a future was, was really moving and, and um, I want to imagine that with you. Uh, I will say that, uh, you know, um, Mike talked about a backlash uh, and about a kind of um, uh, the difficult work that starts now. And I want to talk about a different part of the difficult work that starts now, which is that, uh, or that started after the protest, which is that once you start thinking about alternative systems, you have to make sure that those are funded in ways that are supported, uh, that are supporting the ways that people call on them. And so, for example, right now we still have in, in for example, our homelessness response, we still have LAPD involved quite a bit in it. And that's work that Chief Moore, as you said, Melina, at the beginning of this meeting, has said that you know they don't even want to be doing right now. But unless we can fund 24-7 response that is unarmed, that is rooted in care, that is rooted in social workers and mental health uh, caseworkers going out uh, at any point when people are calling for that support, I think we will not be able to satisfy the needs of people who are calling for urgent help. And I think unless we build a system around people's needs, whether it be the needs of unhoused residents or housed residents who are calling on the system for help, um, I think we will, we will, um, we will fail to build that beautiful world that you described, Kendrick. Uh, and so I wanna do that work. I wanna make sure that we're funding these alternatives to public safety in ways that go beyond just a pilot, um, that really build out the systems that we need, that really build out, for example, ways in which to access mental health care um, instead of having it be uh, primarily directed to our jail system. And I know that that requires partnership with the county, and I want to do that hard work to work with the county. But I think that also requires the council coming together to advocate for these resources together as one voice and saying to the county, this is what we ask for and demand for our people, because it is, it is the way forward for us as a city. So I wanted to thank you again for inviting me. Um, and I really look forward to working with all the council members on this call. Um, and with the rest of the council as well to do that work and to, to do that advocacy going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilman Ridley Thomas, are you still on with us? I am. Great. I've been here the entire time. So it says you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Oh, can, can we give Councilman Ridley Thomas uh, should be able to start. Can we start now? All right, now it's connected. So uh, thanks again. I think uh, some specific things that you should expect attention being uh, paid to is um, a word about eviction defense. If we expect to address disproportionate impacts on people of color, it seems to me that Part of that means they have to have secure places in which to live. Uh, homelessness has to be addressed in large measure by prevention efforts. I think you should expect more attention being given uh, to uh, including uh, community and inter intervention workers uh, that address uh, the crisis on our streets as um, a way to speak the language of unarmed responses. Uh, both uh, Marquise Harris Dawson and Curran Price, as well as myself, are intent on moving an agenda forward with respect to the issue of guaranteed annual income. Um, it's in the budget at uh, some 35 million at this point. Our hope is to uh, put forth an expansion of that because it speaks to the issue of economic justice and the dignity of persons who have been otherwise exploited, demeaned by which virtue of systems, historical systems, institutional racism, structural racism, systemic racism. And it seems to me that that's an appropriate response. Uh, we're leaning in on the 
issue of implementation uh, more in the way of mental health collaboration on the unarmed response. And so some of the things that we did in the reimagine letter a few months ago will repeat themselves and present themselves in the context of the current budget deliberation. So many of the things that have been raised tonight uh, will be pursued. There's no two ways about it. Uh, three of us have already begun talking about it. Councilwoman Raman and I are talking uh, specifically about how we expand uh, those who are on the street engaging. Uh, the reason in many instance, instances for uh, law enforcement being called on is because there are not appropriate alternatives. I think we got to build on the alternatives. This discussion is about alternative to incarceration, alternatives to incarceration as is the case, um, has been the case in the County of Los Angeles, then you have to build more behavioral health centers. You have to build more recuperative care centers. You have to build more psychiatric urgent care centers, more uh, of those kinds of uh, system-wide infrastructure pieces. The same is true with respect to building more street engagement with multidisciplinary teams that move 24 seven uh, to address the crisis on our streets and to help people with respect to re re being restored to a place of dignity and self-worth that can't be denied. So I simply wanna say that I fully anticipate uh, pursuing any number of these things and more, and that's what we have to do. Um, and so thank you for the opportunity to be heard, pleased to be here to share these points of view, keep a close eye on what's going on in the budget deliberation process you'll hear a number of these things being surfaced and, and advanced. It is not always the case that one expects them to be adopted. Uh, there is a level of uh, justification for advocating because in the advocacy, uh, we get better. We learn how to move it forward. We educate, we get uh, a number of council members who are yet to be uh, persuaded uh, in a position where they hear it, understand it, and then we have to keep pressing the case. That's what you will see. Uh, that's what I uh, am about. That's what I intend to do. And once again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to make these uh, closing remarks. Thank you. And we're hoping that you all can hang with us for seven more minutes. We'll have a hard stop at 830, but there are questions coming in from the community on Facebook. And Megan Castillo, one of our um, leaders in Black Lives Matter is going to just facilitate those questions if we're okay with that. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. So as you've heard here tonight, there's a pretty robust conversation happening around the budget, right? The people in your community, people, your constituents are very clear on what they expect to happen. Um, and they're expecting you to implement the people's budget and to do exactly what it is that, um, they have essentially voiced their opinion on, right? All this work, all this root work and research that suggests that people want resources that actually keep them safe. And so um, there are a few questions that are coming in the chat. One of which is, has any city council member committed to defunding the police? And if not, why haven't you? And so I'll open that up for any of you to answer. So that's for any city council any member city who would like to. I can share that, um, you know, I did talk about, I issued a budget letter um, today as um, part of, you know, the budget deliberations, which are still ongoing, where I talked about two things. One was uh, making sure that we fund these, what are, you know, what, what is being put into this bucket of alternatives to public safety beyond just a pilot phase. Um, that we fund them more expansively uh, and that, um, you know, talking about kind of 
uh, increasing the LAPD budget relative to last year in the broader context of what we're facing as a city in terms of homelessness, in terms of what we're facing in, in terms of service needs, um, that was really troubling to me. Uh, and I think it's something that we should be thinking about uh, as we proceed through these budget discussions. So, um, you know, this is what this is what I've shared, uh, and you know, con what we're continuing to what I'm continuing to advocate for in this process. Thank you for that, Council Member Nithya. Um, it's a they... matter of public record. The process is that um, council members have an opportunity to make proposals as to where they would like emphasis placed. Um, and the, uh, the range of things that uh, I propose, my team proposed are uh, on record and uh, it is typically not the case that is prescribed where the money comes from. Um, it is the case that we determine where it should go. Um, and fully understanding that it's a zero sum process to a large degree. Um, when I say in effect that we need more resources for eviction defense, more resources for intervention, there's more resources for street engagement and the like. I'm fully cognizant that it has to come from somewhere. Um, and to the extent that that is the case, then we engage in uh, the process from where it comes. First step is to say, this is a priority, we should do this. And it goes from there. That has been my approach, it is my approach. Uh, over the arc of my career and uh, public life. And uh, I'm confident that we will uh, see uh, outcomes that are favorable in this instance. Many times uh, resources are not being fully disclosed is what I found out, but it takes a majority of any given body, whether it's the board of supervisors or the city council to determine what the deal is going to be. Uh, my emphasis is on where the money should be directed. And by that, I stand and I'm going to lean in as effectively as possible on that. I think homelessness is the defining, defining moral crisis in this city. It disproportionately affects Black people, it is an intersectional issue. It has implications for domestic violence. It has implications for land use. It has implications for mental health, substance use, and a range of things. Uh, and it's incredible to me that uh, there has been some degree of tolerance for the fact that this is a city with 8% Black people and in excess of 30% of the homeless population being Black people. We got to lean in on that in a substantial way. That's my commitment. All right. Would any other council members like to uh, chime in on this? I think we're coming up on time, Megan. So if we could pass it to Tyler. Cool beans. Let's pass it to Tyler. Thank you. Hey everyone, good evening. So I'm gonna close out with some announcements to- A substantial uh, way. Okay. I'm gonna close That's out with some announcements to get everyone out in the streets every Wednesday for the In Police Association's action at 1313 West 8th Street. That is across from the LAPPL. So join us please every Wednesday as Baba Keeley says, 3 p.m. And then also we want to encourage you to support black owned businesses. We have our verified black owned business campaign. That's every Thursday. We highlight a new uh, VBO as we call it business and it's mother's day weekend. So support simply floral design and they are a dynamic mother daughter duo in downtown LA. And we have information on our Instagram at BLM Los Angeles. So please support them. They have beautiful flower arrangements and plants.
for all the mothers and people that you want to call mother <laughs> and mamas in your life. And so please support them. It's at 315 East 8th Street, Simply Floral Design. And then we're going to close out um, this gathering as we do with every Black Lives Matter Los Angeles gathering with Asada. And these are words of affirmation. And so just repeat after me, we're going to start, I'm going to start in a whisper and then grow to a shell. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our, it is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love, love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Ashe. Ashe. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you to all our presenters. Thank you to the seven members of the Los Angeles City Council for being with us tonight. Thank you for everybody watching on Facebook. Please continue to send in your comments. Complete that survey at peoplesbudgetla.com slash survey. Share it with folks you know and join us next Thursday and every Thursday for This Is Not A Drill right here on Facebook. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, everybody.